Shrewsbury has been at the heart of the British textile industry for literally hundreds of years. This building where we are now was built and occupied by Wormald and Walker. They are one of the largest employers in the town and had a worldwide reputation for the quality of the blankets they manufactured. In 1932, a film was made of the blanket manufacturing process. The film was in black and white and completely silent. I don't know how many people had the chance to see it at the time, but it lay forgotten for 70 years. In the meantime, the firm of Wilmold and Walker closed and the premises were eventually acquired by the Calder Group. In 2003, Derek Bedford and Ken Crow began a collaboration to make the early film a valuable record of what is now a bygone industrial period. The soundtrack was added together with the reflections of past employees about life at the time. Unlike the original, it is planned that this updated version will become a useful historical record and be widely available. Appreciating the historical value of such films, the team then went on to produce a second one, this time recording the manufacture of carpets in the same premises that had once produced blankets. We hope both films will make a contribution to the history of the town and help future generations to a better understanding of the past. Anyone from the Wormald and Walker 1932 film who entered the offices today would be pleased to see that the present owners of the Calder Group have had the foresight to retain the beautiful oak panelling which gives the office block such character. They would also see that compared with 1932, how few people are needed in the modern office. The first stage of blending where all the components are assembled onto the conveyor belt and rotated and mixed. Here you can see the teeth of the Fianort, which rips open the fibres, it, it blends and mixes. And of course it has to be very, very closely guarded. Unlike the old system, just two men are now required to load the machine initially, after which the process is fully automated until the blended material is delivered to the baling press. The two stages of blending are in separate buildings and the material is blown across the yard via the ducting from one to the other. You can see the telescopic conveyor layering the fibre along the length of the bin. When the bins are full, they then have to be emptied and transferred into either another bin where further blending ensures a uniformity or from this bin we transfer directly into the baler. High powered fans carry the fibre as far as 50 metres away to the next process. When the fibre has been through the blending process, it has to be put into a package that's suitable for handling and take to the spinning process. So usually the bales weigh up to 200 to 230 kilos. The hydraulic rams press the fibre down into a uniform size. The outer areas of the bale are covered by polythene in order to keep the blend clean. In this 1932 clip, it is blankets that are being baled, but it makes an interesting comparison to compare methods and numbers of people involved. The 
steel wires are inserted as a means of clipping the bale together and preventing it opening once the hydraulic pressure is released. The forklift truck moves the bale to the next stage of processing, which is carding. First stage of the carding process involves the hopper. Bales of fibre are placed into the hopper to ensure we get the optimum blending. The machine of course is fully enclosed around the perimeter. This is an overhead shot. The first part of a carding engine is called a scribbler. And the second part of the carding engine is called the card and this is where the fibres are open. The webbing coming off the first stage of the carding machine, which is the first opening of the fibres after the material has been blended. And at this section it's going across into the scotch feed where it's transferred into the carding part of the machine. You can see the real carding action where the workers and the strippers are pulling and selecting the fibres gently opening them, forming them into a web which are then transferred further and further into the carding machine. The carding machine operator doffing off the full bobbins of sliver. By the end of the carding process, the yarn, which at this stage is called slubbing, is beginning to take shape, but there are still more processes before it can be used. After carding, the sliver has to be spun, during which it is drawn into a finer thread, and at the same time it is twisted. At this stage it could be used for weaving cloth but cloth is not being produced here. Along the length of the spinning frame, there are 144 spindles, each representing a one kilo package. The spinning process can take anywhere between one to two hours, depending on the thickness of the yarn. tip of the spinning frame forms a sure grip to enable the twist to be inserted. This process is showing where the twist is inserted and how it's wound onto the bobbin where it rotates around the stainless steel ring and the yarn is retarded slightly by a traveller which forms a winding process onto the spinning bobbin. The yarn required for weaving into carpets needs to be thicker. This is achieved in two stages. The first is to wind the required number of threads onto a single unit.
When the yarn has been spun, it's then assembly wound onto a package prior to twisting. The yarn is measured for length to enable the correct number of meters to be allocated to each package. This shot shows two threads being wound onto a single cone. Then, by rotating an arm around the cone, the threads are twisted together, which makes a thicker, stronger thread. In the twisting department, yarns of two, three, four plies are assembled together in one process. This yarn then follows a yarn thread path which goes round the spindle, up through the tensioning device and up onto the final wound cone. The twist is put into the yarn to give various thicknesses. Various carpets demand various thicknesses of yarn. Two-fold yarn, three-fold yarn, Different types of carpet manufacturer, Wilton or Axminster may use two or three ply yarns. The yarn now needs to be washed. It's called scouring. For scouring to be effective, the yarn must be reeled into a much looser form. After the spinning process of coloured yarns, the yarn is transferred onto a hank, and the operator here is tying off the hanks before they go into the washing process ensuring that the threads are tied neatly and held neatly and preventing distortion when the hanks are handled further down the production process line. end of the scouring process. At intervals of two to three meters the hanks are placed onto tape conveyors which process through a series of bowls and squeeze rollers. At the end of the scouring process, the operator removes each hank carefully. Each hank has been washed and squeezed several times using detergent to wash out the residual grease. Freshly scoured hanks now need to be spun dried. These bags contain hanks of yarn. The bags are perforated to allow the moisture to disperse. Placed into the huge hydro, the lid is sealed, and for about 10 minutes, the process of a huge spin dryer takes place, extracting the the moisture.
die house there are 20 dye machines ranging in capacity from 1 kilo up to 1,000 kilo. The machines are various shapes and sizes but um, they all work in the same principle. We have a motor which circulates dye liquor through the hanks. The temperature of the water is then raised to the boil via closed coil, steam heated. Chemicals are added initially, the yarns run with the chemicals and dye stuffs are added before the steam is applied. The whole cycle time is about uh, two hours. The tank is used to recover heat from wastewater used in the dye house. The sample of yarn is then taken into the laboratory and the shade is checked against the master standard. If the shade did not uh, match the standard uh, accurately, then an addition would be made to the dye vat in order to bring the bulk yarn onto shade. Every effort is made to get the shade right first time, but more often than not, uh, additions are required. Before the hanks can be processed any further, they must be dried thoroughly. The dryer is the final process in the, uh, in the wet processing uh, procedure. We have a drum dryer which consists of a series of drums heated by steam batteries. The large fans create suction, uh, basically sucks the hank to the drum, forcing warm air through. Warm air is then saturated with moisture and expelled to atmosphere. In the winding, this is the final stage prior to customers who manufacture tufting yarn to receive their yarn. One operative normally tends eight spindles, the hanks which were tied neatly on the reel and now loaded onto the swift of the winding machine. On this machine, an electronic eye on each spindle automatically detects if a rogue end, a thick end, or even a thin end is present in the yarn. It will automatically stop the spindle and the fault can be removed. It's imperative that she puts this on and the only reason it should stop is if a fault occurs. This is the beaming department. A lot of people may have known it in the olden days of the warping. These beams are made for the narrow lums, both 91 and 69 centimetres wide. As you all know, there is the warp and the weft. The weft runs horizontal and the warp's vertical. Before the yarn can be woven into carpet, the process of winding onto spools or cheeses is carried out. Up to eight colours can be used in the design on a traditional loom. Each spool holds a given length of yarn, which is predetermined before startup, and the spool is automatically moved from the machine when this length of yarn is wound. The machine then repeats its cycle. The accuracy of the length of yarn is important to the weaving process to minimize any wastage. Once the full complement of colors have been wound, the yarn is ready for being woven into narrow 
or broadloom carpet. The weaving shed itself, the creels, where the colours are determined by the designer to suit the design that is necessary for the customer. The weaver's job there is inspecting the what is known as the yarn carriage where all the ends are, for ends that are missing, etc., where it would then stop the loom and replace the end back into its own carrier. Carpets with a complex pattern are woven on a loom called a jacquard. The jacquard is reading the cards that you'll see in a moment there, which is selecting the colours from the creel to make up the design for the customer's requirements. Each card is one row of tufts with the colours required for that particular design. colours being selected by the jacquard as the gripper takes the end and then the knives cut it, put it into the what is known into the work at the bottom and you can see the warps and the weft which holds the tuft and there's the design itself. Our salespeople meet with clients and they look at designs and the portfolios that our clients have and then they choose a design and then it comes back to us and sometimes the colours need changing. Um, so what we do is we go onto the computer, change the colour. You can see how it's changing to a red colour and then to a yellow, and then to a white. And if I zoom out a bit, you can see that the whole design has changed. And what also happens sometimes is they, they might need a texture. So if we pick a texture from another file, just change the colour of the texture. Go back to the original design and take the texture, which is on the brush. I'll just knock out one of the colors. So we've got this ready color, orange color. And then I can fill in into one of these areas. Say, say they found that there's too much of the darker color. So I can just fill that with the texture. Things can be changed. So that's got a bit of texture in it now. The modified design is then sent to the customer and they receive prints and samples and then they choose which design they want to specify and then the order goes through to sales. This is a sales office where once the designs have been approved by the customers, the representatives then will ring through to sales who will generate the orders. The orders are being put on there now 
when they will be forwarded through to production. The girls now in the sales office spoke to production and the people are now in production are looking at the looms, 26 looms available for the dates when we can get to loom and then we will give back the delivery date to sales and we'll advise the customer. The automatic cart stamper where the design will send down the floppy disk for the loom itself to make the design up for the jacquard on the loom to read the rough tufts that is required for each of the colours to make the carpet. In days gone by, this process was done by hand where it would take you roughly between five and ten minutes per card to cut. There is a design that the cart stamper is reading. This machine I'll do one card in approximately one minute and twenty seconds. The lacing machine is where once the cards have been cut according to the design requirements, then they are all laced together. So there's no one going up and down the ladder putting one card on the jackyard. The card's starting at number one and we'll finish off at whatever the design requirements may be. There's three looms per operative with one loom already clothed waiting. If any of, for other, any other reason the other loom stands for a beam or for a creel change, which is where we change the design to another particular design that we would then will start the other loom. But he's responsible for the weaving of three looms at any one time. The looms are running on a three shift system, six to two, two to 10, 10 to six, first shift on. 6 a.m. Monday morning, and last shift off, 6 a.m. Saturday morning. The customer will ask design to do a particular design, particular shades. We will send what is known as a pegboard along to the customer, who may want to lighten the shade, darken the shade, remove a colour. There you can see the design from the grid in the disc that has come down from the design studio. It works on the same principle as the loom itself where it will take one row of tufts for each particular design. Then the, uh, the lady there will put on a false back into it which just holds the tufts so the customer then can see not as a quality issue what she's going to get, but just for design purposes only, where we can change the design, change the colours, whatever the requirements may be. The mending department where every piece of cloth is inspected, tufts that are be missed for whatever reason we replaced. Any faults that are in the carpet for whatever reason will be rectified before moving on to the final process of latex in and shearing. The mender there just using an ordinary dining needle and putting the necessary colour back into the position where it should be, where the loom for whatever reason is missing. Moving on to what is known as latex and finishing. The 
a drying drum where the latex has been applied to the back of the carpet which assists with the anchorage of the tuft holding it into its backing. And that has been dried now with its latex compound. And on the finishing plant itself, the shearing operation, which levels off the tuft of the carpet after the weaving process and gives it its final polish. The seaming process where customers will send plans of the installations where the carpets are going, where the two guys on the seaming machine will measure off the installation, cut it, plan it, and then present it up to the machine to be seamed together. Whatever shape the customer is requiring, whether it be going into a hotel, foyers, restaurants, and the shape will be 90% there. The only thing that they do then, the fitters will. Uh, cut the remainder to the rest of the shape that required. The R&D showroom forms an important link between the yarn spinner and its customers who may be involved in either woven or tufted carpets. Colour to the prospective purchaser of carpet is the most important feature in their choice. Light beiges, medium beiges, dark beiges still outsell all other colours. Greens, terracotta and blues also feature. To be first with new forms of raw material types and colour ranges, be it smooth yarn, berber yarn or mixtures, is very important as each season new ideas are sought. Here within our showroom are design or colour projections for the next season, which are shown to our customers who accept or modify the product to suit their own marketing projects. From the initial development in yarn form, it is not unusual for a project to take between 6 to 12 months before carpet is delivered into the customer's showroom. In the 75 years since the first film was made, the world has moved on. Nobody knows what the next 75 years will bring, but I for one firmly believe that Dewsbury and textiles will still be linked.